Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. It's actually my, my third time, I think, speaking at this forum. Uh, last year, I opened with a um, pretty sad machine learning oriented joke. I decided to pass on that this year and you know, skip straight to <laughs> what brought us here together. Um, since last year, we founded Nugata. Uh, Nugata, I think, is a perfect fit for this evening and for what we're talking about because, in essence, what we do is we design and deploy solutions, or what we call them circuit boards, that help um, translate or sort of bridge the gap between a very complex and somewhat chaotic uh, vendor and technology landscape and the machine learning problems or business use cases that organizations are trying to solve. Um, and while doing that, it needs to also address the huge challenge of, uh, as, as Beth just said, a very complex and somewhat uh, insufficient, in some cases, data environment. So the question is, how do you do that? Uh, and how do you design these solutions? And what I wanted to do today is just talk through a few guiding principles that we try to implement when we de design these circuit boards, just as a sort of a way to think about how to live at that, that point that Nadav said, the, the edge of chaos. Um, what I'm going to talk through is sort of one, one set of challenges, just as an example. And, and I'm going to be focusing on the e-commerce world. So the e-commerce world for many consumer good companies is, is the definition of chaos, right? They're used to, for hundreds of years, working with stores, bricks and mortar stores, and they understand that business as you know, few people ever will. They know exactly what to do, exactly how to position their products next to their competitors in a way that makes sense and wins market share. But then came along e-commerce and completely broke that up. And so, how do they adapt to this environment, this environment where they have significant data gaps. They no longer know who the buyer is. They can't go to the shop and see who goes in. They don't know the demographics of who's buying unless the e-commerce platform reveals that to them. Um, there are many, many different challenges around the data environment. They have to compete with thousands of different search terms. So how do you position a product in an effective way for probably 10,000, thanks, for probably like 10,000 different search terms, um, all of which could be relevant for your product. How do you do that? Without doing that, it's very, very hard to optimize. And then finally, you're competing in most of these platforms with an array of products that you've never had to compete with before. In a typical shop, you have a few tens, maybe dozen, you know, uh, 50 different varieties of any given product. On Go on Amazon and do a search for that specific product, you'll see brands you've never heard of before. You get lists of hundreds of hundreds of different competitors. So this presents really uh, quite a dramatic challenge for, for, e for uh, consumer goods players. The first, the first step is always the same, right? The first step is I need to define what I'm optimizing for. What am I trying to solve? In this case, if I'm trying to solve for uh, e-commerce or success in e-commerce, uh, that means I need to generate basically two things. I need to get clicked on. My product has to get clicked on through the search, and I have to get conversions. It has to be added to the shopping cart and then checked out. Um, what can I affect, right? That's another question. There's a lot of things that I don't really control, or at least not directly control. But what can I affect? I can impact the price. I don't have con direct control over it always, but I can definitely impact it through discounts, promotion, etc. I can do campaigns. I can advertise, and I can optimize around that. I can optimize my, the title of my products, what it's called, the keywords, the backend keywords, the search algorithm sees, and I can optimize the picture that I choose to display for the product, and there's a set of other criteria that I can do. I'm just choosing sort of just a few as an example. Once, once we've done that, but once we've seen and we sort of defined the problem that we wanted to solve, the next step, and this is sort of, uh, Nadav alluded to that as well, is always you have to put some structure on this. There is really three main reasons that we have to put this structure on. The first one, we have to understand uh, the decision-making process of the problem that we're trying to solve. Without that, there's very little we can do. The second is we have to define what we call the solution space. So identify all these elements that we can actually control and how we can control them. And then finally, we have to be able to match data to the specific areas that we're trying to investigate. And we have to identify all the different data sources that are either within the organization, or we can get from the e-commerce uh, platform, or that we can collect ourselves, but that are critical for us to be able to solve this puzzle. Without the data, there's very, very, very little we can do. Once we've done that, 
The next step is to sort of design the circuit board or the solution that we're trying to put together. And I'm not going to get into too much detail on how we do that. There's a very, very lengthy process that uh, is very heavy on the data preparation side, uh, which is a huge issue. But we'll sort of, let's assume we've solved that just for now. And I wanted to talk through a few of the problems that are typical or typically come up along the way. The first one is missing data. Quite often, when, when I'm a consumer goods player in the space, and this can be applied to many, many other different domains, I don't have all the data I need. And the question is, what, what do I do, right? I can try and optimize with missing data. Um, the problem is you will get suboptimal results, and many, many times you actually get bad recommendations, bad insights that are actually value detracting. Um, and, and so what do you do in this world with insufficient data? There are really two main approaches, and um, many other variants, but two main approaches that you can use. The first one is you can go out uh, and you can try and get external data sources. Um, how do you do that? Well, there are many, many different external data providers, and they're very, very good for many, many different purposes. You do have to really think about, though, uh, one very important thing, which is the methodology in which the data is collected. If you're going to be basing your recommendations, your insights, your work, your analytics on this data, it has to be well understood by you. You have to know where it comes from. You have to know how it's collected. Is it stable over time? Uh, what is it susceptible from in terms of changes in the market that you may not be aware of? If you don't understand that, it's don't base your solution on, on, on this data. So work with those external third-party data providers and, and dive deep into their collection, collection methodology until you really get a good sense of what's going on. Um, the second type of external data you can use is, of course, data that you collect yourselves. And in some cases, you have to do it because it just doesn't exist elsewhere. Uh, but this can be a significant investment. And typically, this is an area where you may want to collaborate with other, with other potential uh, partners. The second uh, approach is, is to try and basically ex extrapolate from the data that you do have. Uh, there are risks there as well, but in some cases, it does provide a very, very good source of additional data that you can use to train your, your, your models, to, to build your analytic systems on, and to help you get a fuller picture of the environment in which you live. The second data is, is the complexity of the search in this case that we've discussed before. How do you optimize, in this case, against thousands of different search variants um, with, with a group of products? If, if I'm trying to position my product, what is it competing against? And, and this is sort of a unique thing about e-commerce. In the traditional bricks and mortar world, this is easy to understand, right? Every shopper that goes into a shop sees the same aisle. They walk down the aisle, the same products are next to each other, uh, you can go to the shop yourself, you can see who you're competing with, what their prices ranges are, how they're positioning their products, and every different shopper that goes will have exactly the same experience. In e-commerce, not the case. In e-commerce, what happens is every shopper logs onto the platform, does its search, and then the search algorithm that you don't really understand or know will choose the sort of aisle that the shopper will see. It will choose the products that your product will now be compared against. How do you, how do you position around that? You have to simplify. That's the second core principle, right? You have to simplify this problem. And in this case, what we call them virtual aisles. What we did, it's, there's a little bit more um, sort of more to this than, than just that. But basically, we're trying to understand from the search algorithm, algorithm perspective, what searches result in very similar aisles? And if we can cluster those groups now into virtual aisles, now we have something we can optimize against. We no longer have hundreds of different variants or thousands. We have eight, 10 clusters. And now we know which, in which clusters our products are competing and how. Finally, it's all about uh, getting impact. And you can't really get impact without getting good recommendations from this engine. So the, the final challenge along the way is how do you get actionable recommendations from all the data you collected? So how do you do that? Um, just to highlight a few examples. Um, if you're looking at price optimization, uh, you want within this virtual aisle that you created, to now compare how your product is priced relative to the other products. You can also, if you collect the right data, understand how it's positioned relative to uh, winning products in the same space. So the products that are leading the category in the same space. And you can understand what the pricing mismatches are potentially, where you have the opportunity to premium price or where value is, is the winning strategy. Uh, you can also run analytics, and this is quite exciting, on, on the image itself. And, and we can see uh, oftentimes that there are 
some color schemes, just as an example, but the color is just one of the potential areas that are, um, that are dominant for specific sort of virtual aisles. So people who go to a specific virtual aisle, let's say in this case, salty snacks, like the color orange, right, or, or yellow, because that speaks the language that they've been used to, uh, and that's the colors that they're looking for, and that's, those are the colors they'll be clicking on. If your product, for example, is predominantly red or blue, it may mismatch and may then for miss a lot of the potential clicks that, that customers are, are, are going to um, just pass you by. And then finally, the product description, the back-end keywords, and here is sort of your classic just text analysis. So what phrases are overweighted in the winning products relative to the, the rest of the aisle? Um, are there specific phrases like healthy, natural, these may be trends or either new trends or existing ones that you have to address if you're going to win in the specific uh, virtual aisle? And all of these searches and many, many more are, are possible really because we sort of, we structured the problem, understood the data and then sort of simplified it into sort of the virtual aisle concept to make it workable. Um, just to leave you on sort of the last uh, four thoughts to just to summarize the core principles behind our approach. Um, the first one is, is the structure, right? Without structure, uh, just don't carry on. Uh, invest, and every second you invest in structuring the problem uh, before you kick off the analytics effort will save you weeks of wasted time down the line. Um, and the second one is simplify. Don't always solve the most complex problem where you don't have to. It doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's actually suboptimal to solve a complex problem. You have to have the right, da right data, and, and Beth said that, and I completely agree. I think without the right, right data, you are you just, again, don't kick off. If, if you can understand, and this is part of why we structure, understand what the data requirements are, you can really, really make sure that you're kicking off the projects that have the highest potential to, to be successful and then to be translated into a production-ready effort. And then finally, at the end of the day, all of this means nothing if you can't drive action. And this is not just an analytics problem. This is a business problem. You have to engage the right business stakeholders early enough in the journey, uh, if you were the analytics leader, uh, to make sure that what you're talking about is actionable and that there are uh, the, the right requirements uh, in, t in terms of transparency or model explainability for one uh, are met during this effort for this to actually be useful and to this be actually drive business decisions. Thank you very much.